Dr. Hanan Ashrawi, it's so wonderful to have you here at Brown University. Yesterday you Thank gave a you. talk. Mm -hmm. May I call you Hanan? Please, it's much easier. <laughs> oh. We're old friends after yes. all. Yeah. Uh, Hanan, yesterday you gave a talk to a packed audience in an event sponsored by Middle East Studies about Oslo, the mm -hmm. 20th anniversary of Oslo, and your title was Oslo Process versus Peace. Mm -hmm. Can, can you tell our audience <laughs> what you meant by that? Yeah, well, ironically, that's the thing. We thought of a peace process as a means towards achieving peace, that the real objective is having independence and, and self-determination for the Palestinians and two states living side by side, Palestine and Israel, in peace. Instead, the talks themselves, the process themselves, the process itself, gained a life of its own and it became an objective rather than a means towards achieving peace. So uh, uh, everybody talks about talks, let's talk, let's negotiate and so on. But to us the issue of negotiations is an issue whereby behavior is consistent with the requirements of peace. I, if you're talking about two states and you don't steal the land of the other state. Two, if you are going to have a negotiations process then there should be clear uh, terms of reference, a clear foundation on which you are talking and there should be clear objectives. And uh, when you sign agreements, you should honor them. Uh, instead, we ended up with a prolonged process where everybody felt so long as the parties were talking to each other, given the asymmetry of power, of course, between occupied and occupied, that that's okay. Have them talk, give Israel a free hand to wreak havoc, to build more settlements, give Israel more time, and give Israel immunity to act with impunity. And for the last, not just 20 years, but for the last 22 years, that's what's been happening under the guise of talks since the beginning of Madrid, not just the signing of Oslo. For many people in our audience, they actually don't know Madrid. Mm. And they don't know the Washington talks, which preceded Oslo by Oslo. two years. Exactly. And what you did yesterday in your lecture was fascinating. You talked about how the Madrid and Washington talks were based on a set of parameters mm. are completely different from the Oslo course. Absolutely. You compared the yeah. two and yeah. that's how you showed the flaws that were inherent in the Declaration of Principles which were mm -hmm. signed in the White House lawn on September 13th, 1993. Can you give yeah, us a right. little idea mm. about the Madrid and Washington talks? Yeah, well, the Madrid talks were based on clear criteria, clear references to international law, to UN resolutions, 242338, acceptance of that as, as a basis. Uh, but also they were based on the land for peace equation mm. and uh, within a specific time frame. And we entered these talks uh, to address the core issues, the real substance, the causes of the conflict rather than the outcomes, rather than manifestations like technical issues, side issues, peripheral issues, or even uh, administrative issues, functional issues. We wanted to address the land itself the issue of boundaries and Jerusalem, and of course the human issue of the, the refugees, uh, in, in addition to the settlements and so on. But we felt that the settlements are illegal and they, they shouldn't even be negotiated, that settlements should be removed because anything that is illegal has to be undone. So uh, Jerusalem, refugees, boundaries, even issues like uh, security to us were you know, even not that significant to be addressed, but it will happen as a result of a just agreement. And uh, we wanted to do that on the basis of international law and within a time frame, and uh, to gain a constituency for peace so that the Palestinians felt that they owned the process, that it reflected their aspirations, their wills, their rights. And it would lead to a just peace that can lay claim to permanence and, and uh, durability. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the uh, Oslo process was based on secrecy. It, it, it was happening at the same time as... A year following, yes. a year or two following our uh, Washington talks. Without the knowledge the of the Palestinian negotiators. Most of the negotiators were not aware of it at all. Yeah. And uh, the agreement in Oslo, the, what is called the Oslo Agreement, was more functional rather than territorial. It, uh, turned the Palestinians into uh, administrators still under occupation. It didn't address the strategic issues of the land itself, Israeli withdrawal. It uh, didn't have guarantees and assurances 
about the behavior of the occupier versus the occupied. It put all the onus on the weaker party, on the occupied, to guarantee the security of the occupier that had a free hand to continue. And of course, it didn't have a constituency in many ways, and didn't deal with the core issues, and it didn't have any guarantees that behavior would reflect commitments to uh, an outcome that is the two-state solution. I mean, these are just, the, this is the tip of the iceberg, but let's say giving Israel a free hand and immunity and time to do what it wants within a power politics paradigm and putting the Palestinians on probation, constantly on good behavior to prove that they deserve a state, uh, created a unique situation where the victim had to prove itself to the oppressor and where we had to get permission from our occupier to be free. So how do you explain that uh, the Madrid talk started right after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the invasion of Iraq and the United mm -hmm. States seemed to be at the apex of its power in the yeah. world. And they actually put significant pressure on Israel. That's right. Uh, Bush senior mm -hmm. said he would withhold $10 billion in loan guarantees to Israel mm -hmm. unless they Mm -hmm. entered into talks, which they did not want to do with the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. talks captured the imagination of the world, mm -hmm. uh, and they seemed to be um, really focused on the core issues, as you said. That's Why right. would the PLO then, in secret, without telling its negotiators, <laughs> accept another agreement with Israel that seemed to be the opposite of what of the basis, mm -hmm. the correct basis that you're talking about of uh, let's have clear parameters and accountability to our mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. as the core of any peace process. Uh, you're right. Actually, the, to go back to the Baker Bush era, this yeah. was the era of, uh, as you said, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and uh, uh, getting together an Arab coalition uh, to work on the issue of Iraq and so on. So they felt, in response to that, that they would launch a peace process that would be the core of stability in the region, mm -hmm. and that would gain the support of the Arabs as a whole. It was a regional approach in many ways, because the bilateral approach had also a multilateral uh, section or uh, uh, component of mm -hmm. the talks. And it's the only time in which an American administration, after Eisenhower, by the way, decided that it can uh, uh, hold Israel to account on issues such as the settlements. Because the linkage of $10 billion loan guarantees to settlement activity was unique mm -hmm. in the history of US-Israeli relations, where Israel has enjoyed tremendous benefits and advantages and preferential treatment and you know, tremendous generosity even in hard times. Israel is the recipient of billions and billions of direct uh, financial aid, even though it doesn't qualify because Israel is probably per capita much richer than the U.S., <laughs> but still. Uh, the, the issue is that this process, as launched in Madrid, was quite different from uh, the agreement that was done in secret. I think primarily because the PLO felt under threat. Not all of it, but some individuals. There was an attempt to dissolve the PLO as being part of the Cold War or the past or liberation and so on and to look for alternative leadership. And uh, uh, Rabin understood the vulnerability of the PLO at that time. And uh, uh, when he signed the, the Oslo Accords, he was pleased with the idea that he got more concessions. And it was Paris who wrote in his book, had we known that the PLO would be that conciliatory, we would have talked to them much before, much longer than uh, before than much, the, earlier, yes. much earlier than the uh, Palestinians under occupation who were much tougher as yeah. negotiators. But there was a sense of self-preservation, mm -hmm. which I do not underestimate, because mm -hmm. the PLO represented a national identity, a history mm -hmm. of struggle. Mm -hmm. It represented Palestinians everywhere. Mm -hmm. It was, at a certain point, the revolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, to us, we were very keen on rescuing the PLO, but we didn't see it as uh, having an agreement whereby the PLO would recognize Israel, Israel would recognize the organization, yes, they, not the, the and land, and not yes, the right to self-determination. Many people don't understand that yeah. Israel recognized the PLO, not the Palestinians' right to self-determination. Exactly, exactly. And uh, that was the 
the concession they needed in order to bring Arafat and many of the leaders of PLO back to back, Palestine. Back to Palestine, where they actually, mm. as heads of a so-called revolution movement, were living under occupation now. Absolutely, that's what happened. That that mm. is another weakness, in the sense that a leadership that was in exile and that represented Palestinians everywhere, because we have more than five million Palestinians in exile in refugee camps. Uh, close to five and a half million. It is the largest and oldest refugee population in the Absolutely, world. Absolutely, yeah. yes. And so they, now they feel they're rudderless. They have no leadership. And to bring this national historical leadership to live under occupation, even though uh, the PLO did set up the Palestinian Authority as an instrument of governance under occupation, um, it still uh, became weakened and it became in, in many ways subservient to the PA uh, Palestinian, terms, authority. The Palestinian Authority mm -hmm. in terms of its finances, in terms of its uh, political authority and so on. Now, you yesterday gave a, an incredibly substantive talk about all the different dimensions of Oslo and why the results that we have today, which is 20 years of negotiations have not gotten mm -hmm. anywhere, at the same time... They've made the situation worse. They've made the situation China, yes. worse, yes. The, the, um, talks with no substance and no the, reality. Talks with no yeah. substance beca mm. became a kind of a, a cover for mm. a very accelerated period of growth of Israeli settlement. Absolutely. Uh, of Palestinian land, mm -hmm. almost foreclosing the possibility of a two-state two solution, That's right. which is a subject we'll be discussing today yeah. <laughs> uh, at, at 4 p.m. at the Joukowsky Institute, mm -hmm. uh, so Joukowsky room of the Watson Institute mm -hmm. here at Brown. I hope everybody can make it. Mm -hmm. um, but the death, or I should say the assassination of Rabin, mm -hmm. seems to also foreclose the possibility of the development of a peace movement inside of Israel. Uh, did it make as big a difference as people say mm. uh, that he was assassinated by the Israeli right wing uh, in order to destroy the, any possibility that the Oslo process can succeed? Yeah. That was one factor. Mm. But there were a series of adverse developments that took place, not just the assassination of Rabin. It was a decisive factor in the Israeli imagination. Mm. We, we do not think of Rabin as God's gift to peace, no, but he's the one who recognized history and the imperatives of history. And you could talk about the clerk in South Africa. He wasn't a peacemaker or a, a, a pure you know, a advocate of idealism, but at the same time he recognized the imperatives of history, which is what Rabin did. Uh, and we knew. To us, he was the bone breaker, the famous, he, he's yes. the one who talked about the Intifada and said, you know, break the bones of these kids so they won't demonstrate. And the army took him literally and started breaking bones. Uh, literally. But because he was a military general, because he was seen as a hardliner, and unfortunately you gain your credentials in Israel by being tough on Palestinians in military terms also. So he did gain those credentials and he could talk about peacemaking. But he assured the Israelis there would be no Palestinian state mm -hmm. at the beginning. It was a gradual process. And he did allow the Oslo process to proceed. That had a tremendous impact on the collective uh, ethos in Israel uh, about peacemaking. Now, instead of triggering a sort of more determination and defiance of the forces of demonization, because they did demonize uh, Rabin and others within the peace camp, gradually there was uh, a shrinking of the peace camp, not just as a result of the assassination of Rabin. There were many other uh, factors. Uh, the, the transformation of Israeli society and the move to the extreme right and to even accepting racist, uh, overtly uh, racist policies and practices and uh, more hardline uh, policies took place as a result of several things. Some of them having to do with the building of the uh, wall, uh, the horrific wall, it, it's a, really an expression of ugliness, it's separation and uh, annexation, uh, some of it having to do with the uh, violence that uh, resulted in a, a really vicious cycle of violence and counter-violence, whether uh, assassination, because they assassinated the leaders, let's say, the, of, of uh, Jihad Islami and Hamas, and as a result there was a series of suicide bombers, and we entered in this, into this lethal cycle that uh, 
manage to scare everybody, so to speak. Instead of talking about the causes of this violence and why it should stop, the violence became a way of suspending any kind of real uh, commitment to peace. Uh, there were, again, a series of legislative moves within Israel and so on. I don't want to go into all these details. But, uh, but yeah, the, the peacemaking been... became very difficult. And I tell you something, Shara, you know this as well as I do, that peacemaking is not for the faint-hearted. You have to take risks, you have to be able to engage, you have to be able to withstand pressures, you have to be able to withstand blackmail and threats and so on, and you have to work very hard at getting people committed uh, to such a move. And it's not something you can do unilaterally. So you do need partners, and this is something we'll be discussing this afternoon. What partnership do we have? Right now, the peace camp in Israel has all but disappeared. There are very few. You have a coalition in Israel that is based on the extreme you know, ideologues, uh, like uh, the, the Likud party and, and uh, Netanyahu. You have people who are settlers, like Naftali Bennett. You have people who are overt racist, uh, like Israel Beitenu and uh, Lieberman. So this coalition is certainly an anti-peace coalition. And the whole configuration of Palestinian weakness and division of Israeli extremism and so on, and of American floundering, to put it bluntly, uh, have not been conducive to uh, our efforts at achieving peace. And now that there is a new attempt by John Kerry to see whether he can revive not a process, I hope. He's talking about negotiations, and we're saying negotiations need requirements for success. Maybe the lessons of the past should be learned. Maybe the whole history of these talks has to be looked at. So you're looking carefully. for courage from Kerry as well. <laughs>